welcome to our April Speaker Series here at the Channel Islands Maritime Museum. My name is Audrey Howard, I'm the Executive Director here. Um, and I have some wonderful news to report this month. We are reopening April 9th, so we hope that you will make plans to come to the museum. We just want to say again thank you to our friends, our supporters, and our community um, for their support during these last 13 months. Your support has meant the world to us, so thank you for being there for us. You'll return to some new things at the museum. We have a new navigation exhibit in our upstairs gallery, and currently we have the annual Oxnard High School Union Art Show in our temporary gallery here at the museum. Coming up in May, we'll be exploring sailors' art, and that will include a variety of arts and crafts, including scrimshaw, knot tying, tattoos, embroidery, and many other forms of sailors' art. We will end the year with the exhibition, Tales of the Whale Whisper, which will bring us the photography of cetacean photographer Christopher Swan. Our 30th anniversary celebration continues. Don't forget to enter our mini eco boat contest this month. The Channel Islands Harbor Lessees Association is the sponsor and they have kindly provided some great cash prizes. Check out the museum website for all the details on the contest. So now on to the speaker series. Our speaker today is someone I've had the privilege to have known for the last 10 years or so. We met through our shared passion for animals, especially horses, and through the time I've known her, she has done some pretty amazing things. Mm. Robin has spent her adult life working in major event, project, major event productions and the motion picture business. She is co-author of the nine indispensable ingredients in every hit film, TV show, play, and novel, and she was the writing partner of Tom Laughlin of the legendary Billy Jack fame for over 30 years. Robin Hutton's first book, Sergeant Reckless, America's War Horse, is the biography of the famous Korean war horse, Reckless, whose heroics were so incredible, she was listed in Life's magazine, Celebrate Our Heroes, as one of our all-time great heroes. She is also recognized as a full U United States Marine. The book was a categorical, categorical New York Times bestseller. It was also the 2015 Book of the Year from the American Horse Publications, and received a gold medal from the Military Writers Society of America in 2016. Robin is also the president of Angels Without Wings, a nonprofit group that she spearheaded that is for the development and dedication of national monuments to Sergeant Reckless, of which there are currently six. One of those monuments is at Camp Pendleton, and I was very honored to be there that day, and it was a very moving tribute to this horse that people think so highly of. Robin was also named Patriotic Citizen of the Year by the Military Order of Purple Heart for her work. In World War II, millions rallied to the cause of freedom against Nazism and the menace of Imperial Japan. But did you know that some of those heroes had fur or feathers? <laughs> War animals guarded American coasts against submarine attack, dug out Londoners trapped in bomb wreckage, and carried vital messages under heavy fire on Pacific islands. They kept up morale, rushed machine gun nests, and even sacrificed themselves picking up live grenades. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Robin Hutton to you this evening, and she will be sharing stories from her book, War Animals, The Unsung Heroes of World War II. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here. I, every time I get to talk about these animals, I always wake up with a smile on my face and a skip in my step, because I know you're going to be learning about some amazing animals, and you're going to walk out of here with a smile on your face and a skip on your step when you finish hearing about these animals. But I have been very blessed to have, have these animals in my life. And Sergeant Reckless started me off on a path that I never, ever, ever expected. And when I discovered her story in 2006, she had actually disappeared from the pages of history. There was only four things uh, when you Googled her name that came up on the internet. And I thought this was a travesty because her heroics uh, were just un unbelievable. And there'll never be another horse like Reckless with what she did during the Korean War. 
So I made it my mission to make sure that this little horse was never forgotten again, and uh, wrote my book and built the monuments, and now I'm hoping to get a, a movie made uh, on her as well. But one of the fun things that I did for Reckless was in 2016, over in Great Britain since World War II, the People's Dispensary of Sick Animals has been giving out an award to animals that have served for gallantry and bravery in, in a military action. And I nominated Reckless for the Dickin Medal. And she was awarded it. She was the fourth horse in history to receive it. The other three were from World War II, and they were police horses. But she, uh, she received this medal. And um, she's the only American horse to receive the medal. And so I went over to England to get it. And when I was talking with the director of the PDSA, I said, why doesn't America have this kind of medal? And I'll tell you what we came up with in a little bit after everything's done. But the fun thing with this was um, I reached out to my publisher and I said, I'm going over there. I need some press. You know, uh, get out some stories, because this is just a really, really big honor that she's getting this medal. And so he was doing some research. He says, you know, there's some really cool animals in this uh, that have received this medal. What do you think about writing a book like Feathers and Fur, you know, War Animals of World War II? And I said, well, I love that idea. And uh, that was the working title for a while until I was at a Marine Corps event and I told some of my Marines that the title of my book was Feathers and Fur. And they felt that was more like a clothing um, description instead of something that they would be seen walking around in or recommending to their friends because it just, it just didn't seem man enough or macho enough for them to be carrying around a book with that title. So, hence the title, War Animals, the Unsung Heroes of World War II. And the book contains war dogs, the war birds, the pigeons, which were so amazing, the horses and mules, and there's a war cat. So I had to give it an American angle. And so when I started doing research for World War II, I was absolutely stunned to find out that we didn't have a war dog program at that time. And when Pearl Harbor hit, a poodle breeder by the name of Arlene Erlanger, and that's her picture up there on the top left, and that's the actress Greer Garson with her poodles. Uh, Arlene got together with her Westminster Dog Show and her American Kennel Club friends and said, we got to get the dogs in on this because they knew exactly what the dogs could do uh, to help guard our munitions plants, our airports, you know, you name it. Whatever could come under attack uh, from the enemy, they would be able to help protect. And so they started an organization called Dogs for Defense. And um, it, they sent out a national cry to people, to the American public, and they donated their personal dogs to the cause. Now, I don't know about you guys, but you touch my Misty, and we're skipping World War II, going right to World War III, because I'm not turning my dog over, you know, to, to go to war. Uh, but 40,000 dogs were donated to the cause. 20,000 made the first cut. You know, either they, um, the breed might not have been right, they might have been too old, maybe they had health issues, we just didn't know. But 10,425 went on to serve with the Coast Guard, with the Army, with the Navy. Uh, the Marine Corps worked with the Doberman Pincher Club of America, and they had over 1,300 dogs donated there as well that went over and served in the jungles of the Pacific. So it was an amazing, amazing effort. And the bottom picture there on the right-hand side, that's President Roosevelt's dog, Falla. And that's his sister um, giving a donation to the War Dog Front. And they, made, they raised millions of dollars. If you put a dollar in, your, your animal could be a, a private first class. If you put $100 in, you could be an admiral or a general in, in the uh, Marine Corps, whatever you chose. But they had these different levels. And so people actually got behind this whole effort. And it was just amazing. And celebrities as well donated their dogs to the cause. So it was uh, really something. So then they set up these training programs around the country. And Dogs for Defense took on the first uh, work in, in training the dogs. And 
the whole thing is not only did they have to train the dogs, but they had to train the people. The men didn't know how to work with these animals. So they, they sent them to Front Royal, Virginia, was the first place that, uh, that this started. And they had to teach the dogs to sit, stay, come. And then once they got through the original training, they then would get them to learn about um, the sounds of war. Maybe, um, you know, with the loud gunfire or the smoke or um, things like that to try to get them acclimated. Because you just didn't know how these dogs were going to react once they got over uh, overseas. But it was really, really something to see all of the training that, that did take place. The Marine Corps then also had their own training as well. And so what was really amazing with, with their training is they mostly had the Doberman Pinscher. Now later it was, it was discovered that the Doberman really was too um, uh, anxious and agitated and it really didn't make the better uh, dog uh, for the, that purpose. And so now today they're using of course the German and the Belgian Shepherds and the, the uh, Belgian Malinois are the, uh, really the amazing dogs. But in World War II it really was uh, the, the um, Doberman Pinscher. So if you look in the bottom picture on the left, that's, um, they, each dog had their own little booklet that was, had their number on it, had who their handlers were, and the, the Marine Corps kept a record of every single dog that they had that went through the, their program. And what was absolutely amazing is I went to the National Archives and they have these books in the National Archives. And the, I was crying like a baby at the National Archives as I'm holding the book of some of the dogs that you'll see. I, went, I held every single book of the first Marine War dog platoon that was over in, the, um, in Bougainville, that landed on Bougainville. And to just see this history, see what these dogs went through, see how their handlers loved these dogs. Um, it, it was really, really something special. And you can see some of the training that went through. Um, they had to, to train the dogs to get off of a ship. And so the bottom right-hand corner, you can see them trying to get them used to getting, you know, going up and down because they were going to be thrown over a ship into the Higgins boats that would land, um, land on ground. And they had to make sure they can get up and down um, the hills. And the top middle picture is uh, a messenger dog, and that's Jack. And so they would train these messenger dogs to, to take the messages back and forth. Um, uh, to report as to what was going on. But there again, they also had to get their dogs used to the sounds of battle and the smoke and the chaos and make sure that they didn't um, you know, have any kind of uh, PTSD or um, just get too scared that they couldn't perform. So in guarding the home front, uh, it was really, really something. These dogs would protect the munitions plants, they would protect any business that they felt was, could be under fire from the enemy. And so uh, they were used as sentry dogs, they were used as attack dogs, they were used as guard dogs, um, whatever they felt was necessary to, to protect the home front. And then of course the Coast Guard had their own set of dogs. And out of the 10,400 dogs that were used uh, uh, for, through the Army and everybody, 3,174 of them were used for the Coast Guard. And the dogs patrolled with the horses and sometimes by themselves the coastlines to, uh, to make sure that uh, um, an enemy submarines um, you know, weren't uh, um, landing or dropping people off. And the gentleman picture there is Seaman Cullen. And this is a very interesting story. Operation Pastorius was really the first um, event that took place that showed really the need for the dogs uh, on the coastline. And this was in June of 42. What happened was a German submarine off the coast of Amangasset, I can never say this word, Amangasset, New York, dropped off four German spies and with enough ammunition and money to wreak havoc on America for over a year. Four days later, they dropped four more off down in Florida. And they were going to meet, and they were going to, they had the Alcoa, 
um, factory they were going to attack. They were going to attack the power plant at Niagara Falls. They had all of this. And Seaman Cullen came up, up upon them, and th he at least got away, which was good. Um, but the men had to bury their, uh, all of their equipment uh, and try to vanish really quickly before they got discovered. Now, a national uh, FBI, this is the largest uh, uh, manhunt at that time from the FBI looking for these eight German spies that uh, um, landed on American soil. And uh, they were captured within a couple of weeks and they were tried quickly. And so that really, really helped launch the whole war dog program as to um, trying to make sure that we were protected on our shores as well. They were trying to bring the war to the American shores and the dogs were really instrumental, as were the horses were, in trying to protect the coastlines. Uh, <clears throat> so the American dogs on the war front, there are some incredible, incredible stories. And the uh, first Marine war dog platoon, there are actually seven platoons that the Marines used um, over in uh, the Pacific. And uh, the Army also sent over quite a few dogs. But these are just some of the wonderful pictures. The two bottom, the left and the, um, the bottom center picture, are from Iwo Jima. And the dogs would protect and stand guard over their handler to give them um, some rest in the whole um, operation. You know, when, when they just were so tired, they would make sure that no, you know, no um, uh, enemy soldiers penetrated the, the camp and that they could indeed get some rest. And so that picture um, is just really something about Butch uh, standing over his uh, handler there. And on the bottom right-hand picture, you can see the dogs being loaded off into the um, Higgins boats that would then be land, uh, take them to shore and uh, all of that. But um, Chips is America's most famous war dog from uh, World War II. And Chips was a husky shepherd mix owned, owned by the John Wren family in, um, up in New York, uh, Pleasantville, New York. And Chips was this really great little dog. He actually won the Silver Star. He's the only dog to be awarded the Silver Star and a Purple Heart. But because he was a dog, uh, they took the medals away from him, which was very, very sad. But what Chips did on the invasion of Sicily in uh, July of 1943, it was Operation Husky. And the, there were three landing parties at different parts along the beaches of Sicily. And um, uh, Chips was on the one closest to the town of Lakata. And when the, when the unit hit ground, they were attacked by an uh, Italian machine gun nest was firing at them. So his handler quickly dug up a, 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 a hole and jumped in it and dug one up for Chips. And as Chips saw him digging his deeper, he started digging his hole deeper and everything because the fire, you know, was coming at him, you know, it was just really something. And so what he did, though, he broke free of his handler charged the machine gun nest. There were four Italian soldiers in there. He got the gunner by the throat, ripped, it, ripped off the gun, off the tripod. He, the guys came out of the hut surrendering because they were more afraid of this war dog than they were of being prisoners of war. You know? And so Chips, Chips did this. And so this unit was able to advance the farthest because of what Chips was able to do. And uh, he then would go on and guard the prisoners of war. Um, and as his, um, one of the fun things is uh, when President Eisenhower learned about Chips's heroics, and this was when he was deeper into Italy, he went over to Chips uh, to congratulate him and bent down to pet him. Well, that was not good because Chips nipped him on the hand. And, but he was all forgiven because that was what Chips was trained to do. But what I love, is that the Eisenhower Presidential Library has made a whole educational program out of chips biting the hand of President Eisenhower. And it is stunning to see. And if you go to their website, you'll see these great pictures and these great exhibits for, um, and exercises and wonderful games for kids to play to learn about 
the history of, of World War II, but also the role that General Eisenhower played with chips. And uh, it, it is an absolute delight, absolute delight. But when uh, on the two uh, right-hand pictures was when Chips was coming home uh, back to Pleasantville, New York. And what is really wonderful is the bottom picture you see there is when he landed back home in Pleasantville, and he's there with uh, Johnny, little Johnny Wren, who was, I think, about four years old at that time. Well, I nominated Chips for the Dickin Medal, and Big Johnny Wren goes over to England to receive the Dickin Medal for his dog, for his war dog. So, sadly, Chips didn't get the Silver Star to keep the Silver Star, but he did get to keep the Dickin Medal, which is known as the Victoria Cross for animals. And uh, it was just a wonderful day to see this war dog be honored uh, at that time. So the first Marine War Dog platoon landed on Bougainville on November 1st, 1943. And they had 24 dogs. They had three German Shepherd um, uh, messenger dogs, and they had uh, 21 scout, patrol, uh, casualty dogs, uh, whatever they needed, whatever they tr were trained to do. And uh, these pictures are just amazing. If you just look and see, um, I love the picture on the top right of the three German Shepherds that were trained by the Army and then went to the Marine Corps as messenger dogs uh, to, uh, to uh, patrol and uh, to, uh, to work with them. And what is great is um, one of the dogs was Caesar. And this was one of the messenger dogs, and he was an amazing dog, and he got wounded on the third day, I think it was, of performing. And the jungles that these dogs had to go through, you know, there wasn't, they couldn't use the walkie-talkies or anything because the jungles were just too thick. And so that's why the messenger dogs were so, so critical. And so when um, Caesar was wounded, they built a, he did make it back with his message, and uh, a sniper had got, gotten him twice, and, um, but they were able to, to rescue him and save him, and he went on to fight another day. But he was the very first dog that uh, was, uh, was injured uh, in, in the battle uh, for the Marines. Andy was an amazing dog. He was a scout dog, and um, as you can see that bottom middle picture, he would lead uh, the pack out. He would be out in front of his team. Sometimes he would be off a leash, and sometimes he would be on the leash. It just all depended on where they were going. And one of the things he was uh, known for is he stopped the unit, unit from going farther. He discovered two machine gun nests on each side of the um, pathway, the trail that they were taking. And so the, it was going to be a crossfire you know, for anybody. They were just going to wipe them out. And because he alerted to the fact that there was this, uh, these nests, he was able to, they were able to take the nests out and they were able to proceed a lot farther. If he had not done that, the whole unit could have been very easily wiped out because it was such, they were hidden so well and there, was, there were two big nests. But Andy went on to, uh, to save the day. And so the, also in my book, I talk about some of the British dogs that um, served. And all of these dogs here had received the Dickin Medal. The dog at the top uh, left is Judy. And Judy is one, when I finished writing Judy's story, she was a prisoner of war dog. She was in the prisoner, a Japanese prisoner of war camp for three and a half years. And the mantra in camp was, if Judy can make it, so can I. Because she had nobody to care for her. She had her one, the one guy who adopted her, Frank Williams, adopted her when he saw her. But still, she had to fend for herself, for food. Uh, and he actually, Frank actually got her to be, get an official number, uh, prisoner of war number. So they couldn't kill her and eat her, because they did, you know, eat, eat dogs. But... Um, she was a real prisoner. And when I finished writing her story, at, uh, I cried for three days. <laughs> this talk just <laughs> touched my heart in ways that, you know, you just can't help but fall in love with, uh, with the heroics. And, I mean, she would bring them snakes and birds and rats, whatever she could find in her foraging at night. Um, 
uh, to bring them food because they just were just wasting away. And uh, if they, one of the guys was going to be, was being beaten or anything, she would rush in and charge at the guards to try to protect them and save them. I mean, they just really loved this dog, and she took such great care of them. In the middle picture on the top is a dog named Sheila, and Sheila actually saved the lives of four airmen whose plane crashed in the Cheviot Hills in uh, England. And... Um, she heard the, they heard the plane crash, she went up there, she helped get them down, and by the time she got them down the hill, the plane blew up and uh, uh, all of that. And so f uh, two men did die in, in the crash. Uh, three other men got down on another part of the hill in another direction. But what was really interesting about Sheila's story is when she had puppies, one of her puppies was sent to South Carolina to one of the families whose son died um, in uh, the plane crash. And so it was really just a, a wonderful, wonderful moment. Uh, the dog on the top right is Antis. He was a, a war dog in that he would go flying with his handler, um, John Bozdek. Uh, and uh, what was really cool about Antis is he could hear the planes coming in before they even uh, were anywhere near in sight. And so he could alert to the planes coming in. And uh, whenever he was in the plane, he was like a good luck charm. And that's what was so cool about so many of these animals. They felt uh, that they were um, uh, just mascots as well as, uh, as war dogs. The bottom picture, I think, is amazing because it shows the Blitz of England. And that little dog there is Rip. And he was a great dog at finding other animals. And um, he would just dig into the, into the uh, rubble and he would find animals or he'd, he'd also find people. But one time he was digging and digging and digging and, and he's heard somebody just swearing like a sailor and just, you know, just squawking and he'd dig down deeper, dig down deeper and they pull it back and it was an irate parrot who was trapped in the rubbish <laughs> and, 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 and it's like swearing at him, you know, because like, get me out of here. <laughs> And I mean, one time he found a goldfish. He and Be he had, there was another dog named Beauty who were just known to be able to find the animals, and uh, it was really something. And then the bottom picture I just love on the left because that's Princess Elizabeth is there with uh, uh, the king and queen, and that's a, a dog named Peter. And Peter was known to find people uh, in in the rubble. And uh, you know, you just can't imagine this blitz, what was going on in England at the time, and all that they had to go for it through. It's it was just really something. So there are a couple of dogs that were a little bit more than mascots. This is Smokey, and Smokey is a Yorkshire Terrier, and believe it or not, Smokey was found in a foxhole in New Guinea. Somehow he got loose from his owner. I, you know, it's just a, a bizarre story. But uh, he was found by uh, an airman who was a photographer for one of the squadrons, uh, Bill Wynn. And Bill taught this dog tricks. And when Bill got dengue fever, he ended up in the hospital, and he took Smokey with him. And Smokey became the very first therapy dog. He would be taken around. The nurses would take her around. And, uh, and uh, she would bring such joy to the men and such a comfort uh, that, she, that Animal Planet has listed her as um, one of the very first therapy dogs. And what is really, really cool about this little dog is the uh, top right picture there she had to string 70 feet of communication wire through an 8-inch pipe. So they didn't have to tear up the airstrip that the pipe ran under. And had that happened, the, the planes, this is on Luzon in, in the Philippines, and had uh, they had to tear up the airstrip to, to lay down this communication wire, the planes would have been exposed, over 200 men would have been at risk, but she was able to do this, and at some parts of the, the pipe had filled up with dirt, and so sometimes she only had like four inches to get through. And so this is why she was just an amazing little dog to be able to, to do that. And then, of course, there's Sinbad from the Coast Guard. And Sinbad is one of my favorite stories because he was really a naughty little dog. He loved to go out to the bars with his sailors. He would jump up. He had his favorite haunts. He would jump up on the bar stool. They'd give him a whiskey shot and a chase it down with a beer. And the guys actually paid for the drinks. 
And so, I mean, he became such a beloved uh, character. But what was wonderful about Sinbad is that the men really felt that as long as Sinbad was on board ship, nothing bad would happen to the ship. And uh, the ship did um, get, um, was attacked and was, um, uh, uh, there were some repairs that needed. But Sinbad stayed with the ship while it went under repairs. And you know, to this day, while the original Campbell was um, uh, uh, sunk, they had a newer ship called the Campbell that exists. And on there is a statue of Sinbad, and it says Sinbad lives. And so that dog is still today, you know, carrying on the tradition of the heroics that it did back, back in World War II. And that, that's, pretty, that's pretty astonishing, you know, when you think about it. Pigeons were just phenomenal. After you read my book, you will never think of a pigeon as a rat with wings again. I guarantee it. Guarantee it. And, you know, with some of the messages that got through from the Battle of Normandy, the pigeons would fly over the English Channel, having never done it before. But they would fly. There were three different birds, the Duke of Normandy, um, William of Orange, I think was one of them, and there was another one, um, would fly the different messages and would report on the course of the invasion. And so many of these birds would do that time again. They were used as spies. They would carry their messages either on a, in a little capsule on their leg, if it was just a short message, or if they had film or a map or something, it was a bigger canister on the back. And what would happen is they would be thrown from planes or they would drop with the men uh, if they were going to be uh, used on, on the mission. But they were also dropped behind enemy lines in France with a letter and water and food for 10 days. And whoever found the bird was to fill out the form and um, report on what was happening wherever this was. And these birds would then be released, and they would come back and uh, report on, on the status of the war. And so it's really amazing when you see these, uh, hear these stories about what these birds did. And G.I. Joe was the only American animal to receive the Dickin Medal during um, World War II. And he was an American bird. Uh, the Allied forces had, uh, were going to attack a town in Colvi Vecchia, Italy. The Germans were uh, entrenched in that town. The bombing mission was set for 10 minutes after 11. Well, what happened was the Germans retreated, and at 10.45, the uh, English had, had gone into the town and taken it over. But they had no way to let uh, command know that the British now are, are in town. And so all they had was G.I. Joe. So G.I. Joe flew 20 miles in 20 minutes and stopped the planes on the tarmac from taking off and um, saved at least 100 Allied soldiers' lives that day. And when he got the Dickin Medal, they flew him back from America over to England to get the Dickin Medal because they were so impressed with what this bird did. And I mean, it just goes on. There were over 500 people that turned out at the Tower of London for G.I. Joe to get his, his, his Dickin Medal. And um, uh, he was actually stuffed. He's at the Army Museum. I'm hoping he goes on display because, uh, I'll, and in a moment I'll tell you uh, about our new medal, but uh, he received our medal as well because of his heroics during, uh, during World War II. Then there are the war horses. We didn't have a lot of horses over there. We only shipped uh, about 49 horses, but we procured over 15,000 mules and donkeys um, during the China-India-Burma uh, uh, conflict. Um, and uh, because it, the, it was so hard to get the horses over there. You know, it took up so much space, feed, everything. So they would procure the ones that they needed, and they found out that the mules were better. But on our coastlines, the uh, horses were used, I think over 3,000 horses were used by the Coast Guard to help guard our coastlines with the dogs, and you can see all of that. Uh, the top right picture are the three police horses, Upstart, Regal, and Ol Olga. 
They were the ones that received the Dickin Medal in World War II, and those, those horses were the ones that worked during, after the Blitz, they would help control all the chaos, try to get people through, um, you know, tried to prevent the looting, just, uh, they were there just doing all kinds of, of great things, and so they received the, the, the Dickin Medal. But uh, I also love the picture at the bottom right of, of one of the mules. You can see them loading up the mule, so it's really just cute. And then, of course, there's a war cat. Now, Simon's story is on the outskirts a little bit of World War II, but it's a war cat, <laughs> you know? So he had to be included in the book. So he actually received the Dickin Medal, and he was on a ship um, called the uh, Yangtze that was, um, go, excuse me, the Amethyst, that was going up the Yangtze River. And this was during Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong's conflicts. And the ship was, uh, it, it was a, uh, uh, flying with, with a white flag, and so it should never have been attacked, but it was attacked. And it landed, it was st uh, stuck on the, uh, the shores of the Yangtze River for over 100 days. And every time the ship tried to move, uh, they would be attacked again. The captain was killed, 21 sailors were killed, um, and Simon was even wounded uh, on this battle, uh, on this attack. And so, but what he did, when he finally got to sick bay and uh, felt better, he became the first therapy cat because he would jump up on purr and knead, you know, all the men and make them feel better. But what he would do is he would protect the food and the, um, any of the rations and the medical supplies as well from the rats. And he got to the point where he was just killing at least a rat or two a day. And he would bring his trophies and drop them at the feet of the captain, who was not a big cat person when this began. But as, as Simon made his way uh, with, with protecting the food supplies, he became a real, um, a real important part of the, of the unit. And uh, so he also uh, received the, the Dickin Medal. And when they landed in Hong Kong, it was Simon walking off the plank, and it was Simon the one that everybody was just snapping pictures of and wanting to get to understand Simon's story. So it's just, a, he's just a great, great cat. So all of these animals, and with the Dickin medal, as I said when I was over there, I, uh, I didn't understand why we didn't have a, a medal like this. And I am very proud and honored to say that on November 14th of 2019, the very first Animals in War and Peace Medal of Bravery was instituted on Capitol Hill. And we honored eight animals. Of course, Reckless, even though she was a third war, uh, she got number one just because I had some pull. But <laughs> we had members of Congress present these medals to the dogs. And Reckless got it, G.I. Joe got one, Chips got one, Cherami, uh, a World War I pigeon, received one, uh, Stormy, a Vietnam scout dog, uh, Luca, who also received the Dickin Medal uh, from Afghanistan and Iraq, got one. And then we had two dogs that were current and alive. One was a New York City Fire Department dog, who was the number one arson detection dog in the country. And then another one was a multi-purpose canine dog that's made, did oh, one over 350 patrols looking for IEDs and weapons and um, high value individuals and made 12 helicopter drops behind enemy lines looking for people and just amazing, amazing animals. And so the little dog peering around the podium was Buka and that was the, the little dog that was the fire department dog who started off as a bait dog in a dog fighting ring, fought his way out, became the top dog in the, the fire department um, arson detection. So it's just really cool. And so this year, we're also going to be, hopefully, we couldn't do it last year, but hopefully this year in November, we're also going to be, we have six animals that we've, we've selected. Three will get the Medal of Bravery, and then three more will get our brand new Distinguished Service Medal. And there's some really amazing, I can't release the names yet, but amazing dogs, amazing dogs that are part of this, and I'm just so, so thrilled with it. But one of the things that this has also done for me and what I love about this museum going through it, um, we want to start an International War Animals, uh, Animals and War and Peace Museum because we feel that you can teach history through the eyes of the animals to kids. Make, they, they, they find ways to really understand and relate to history in a totally different way when you're learning it 
through the animal's eyes or what the animal did. And then like with Reckless, she's such an ambassador for all of those that served during the Korean War that you, know, you can't help but learn the men's stories and the, the, who were a part of her life. And so that's what we're really trying to do and we're gonna start off with some traveling exhibits and, and just try to tell the, the stories of animals from the time of Hannibal and the elephants and the camels that were used to the dolphins and the bats and the, and the birds. I mean, it really, really could, the, the sky's the limit on the stories that we could tell of these wonderful, wonderful heroic heroic animals. So um, that's, that's kind of what we're doing now and what we're, we're very, very excited about. So anyway, that is um, uh, basically the story of my, uh, uh, of my book on war animals. And I just didn't know, does anybody have any questions at all? We're hope to, I'd like to have it a physical one in Washington, D.C., because that's the uh, museum capital of the world. But we will also, at the same time, have smaller exhibits at any, of, any museum or business you know, that would like to have just a small place to you know, kind of expand their exhibits or you know, what they're... Yes, yes, exactly. Traveling exhibit for sure. So, yeah, that's what we're, and I'm looking around getting some ideas. You're, the wonderful things that Audrey was showing me with uh, the touch screens, those are the things we have to build. So, I'm just very, very excited about it. So, yes? So, besides dogs, what other animals are used in today's military? Mostly um, the dogs. I did hear, actually, that pigeons are also being used um, to some degree. Uh, because even though they have the technology, you know, you can't really e track or decipher, you know, a, a pigeon if it's flying. But I hear, I hear that they are being looked at more now. Um, and I think, uh, I, I don't know of any horses or anything else, but I think just basically dogs, that's all that we're really using right now, is, uh, are the dogs. And the multi-purpose canine has become more of a, um, a one dog does all type of thing, uh, where they're just, uh, the intensity of these animals and what they can do is, is truly stunning. And, uh, but uh, they have the German Shepherds and the Belgian Shepherds are like for dual purpose um, service. And uh, then the Retriever dogs, they like the Retrievers for like the one odor type of um, detection uh, for narcotics. You don't have a dog that sniffs both narcotics or explosives because you don't know what they find <laughs> if they can't do both, you know. So they have to either smell one or the other. So it becomes a little bit more specialized that way. But I don't know of any others that are, are being used right now. I'd love to know. Yes? They were used before. I think they were used in World War II. They actually tried to use them, sadly, as like bombs, you know, being able to, you know, take out submarines. Um, uh, but it, it, they, that stopped a little bit. It was like they used bats as well, tried to use bats as incendiary devices and bombs to, uh, to, to, um, to do that. But it, they really didn't have that much control over it. I don't think that they're, to my knowledge, not being used in that, that way today. But uh, it'd be interesting to know if they if they were. But I think it was just in the past they tried they tried to use anything you know that would that they felt would work and get um, the um, whatever they needed at that time. So. Yes. Yeah. So the service you know there's so many great dogs. So the fun thing about our medals now is uh, because the animals in War and Peace. Um, it's the animals during peacetime. So with the service animals, um, that's why we also started the Distinguished Service, because they might not have done something brave in a military action, but their service to um, the, the country or to their handlers or to their unit is, uh, is really, really important. And you can't, you know, you just can't ignore that. So you were just really trying to honor those animals, especially who have done things extraordinary to show really the value of, of what these animals can do. So it's, it's just really, it's really kind of cool. Any other questions? No? 
Well, thank you guys so much. I'm so grateful to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. That's it.